call? Should we I wait guess. another two? That's your call. All right. Let's just start. All right. Okay. So it will be a very interesting talk from all our panelists today, and we'll like to get as much time as well. And as well, um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. We have some international pa uh, participants who have registered interest in this webinar. So welcome to the webinar on International Medical Physics Certification Board Accreditation and Certification, which is held in conjunction with the International Medical Physics Week 2021. My name is Jeannie Wong, and I'm a lecturer at the Medical Physics uh, of Medical Physics based in Biomedical Imaging, University of Malaya. I will be moderating the morning session. Before we start, allow me to go through some housekeeping information. So all delegates will be muted. This is a webinar platform. So it will be on listening mode only for the entire webinar to avoid disruption. If you have any question, please submit them through the Q&A tab that you should see at the bottom of your screen. Don't forget to turn on your volume to be able to hear the presentation clearly. Make sure that you are able to see the slides being projected. If you don't, please re-log in again and that should solve the problem. If not, please alert us on the chat function and our technical team will assist you. You will receive an email after the webinar to fill up the feedback form. Kindly complete the feedback form. Upon completion, an e-certificate will be emailed to you. Right, so to set the scene, let me just say that medical physicists are healthcare professionals that uses physics principles in medicine. We are involved in many different areas of healthcare, particularly in radiotherapy, medical imaging, nuclear medicine, working hand in hand with our clinical specialist colleagues and other allied health professionals, such as the radiographers, radiotherapists, radiopharmacists, and etc. A clinically competent medical physicist is crucial in ensuring patient safety. In many developed countries, such as the US, UK, and Australia, and in some developing countries, they have a national medical physics training and certification system in place to ensure medical physicists working in the hospital are well-trained. However, this kind of setting may not be available in every country. In Malaysia, for example, we do not have such a system in place. So maybe the IMPCB is a possible way to go forward for medical physicists in this country. Now this morning, we are very privileged to have four distinguished speakers from the IMPCB to share with us the importance and the pathway to achieve accreditation and certification via IMPCB. Professor Dr. Colin Otten is the president and chair of the IMPCB board of director. Dr. Raymond Wu, Chief Executive Officer. Dr. Thomas Prong, who's from the Nomination and Election Committee. And Dr. Adele Mustafa, the Chief Examiner and Chair of Accreditation Committee. They will be speaking to us today to shed some light on this matter. So to start off, let, allow me to introduce our first speaker. Professor Dr. Colin Otten is an emeritus professor in the Radiation Oncology Department of uh, Wayne University. He was the Chief of Physics and Director of the Medical Physics Graduate Program for over 20 years. He was board certified by the American Board of Radiology and American Board of Medical Physics for therapeutic radiological physics and radiation oncology physics. Since 20. 14, he served as the president of the International Medical Physics Certification Board, IMPCB. Professor, to some of us, maybe we're still confused with the word accreditation and certification. What are the differences? Could you tell us why is it important to have certification in medical physics? Professor, 
Professor Colin. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, my role here is to convince you all that certification of medical physicists is important. And I do this with two hats on. One that uh, Jeannie mentioned that I was chairing the Wayne State University uh, Medical Physics Graduate Program for over 20 years. And we were the first program to be accredited, but we were the first master's program to be accredited, the first PhD program to be accredited, and the first residency medical physics program to be accredited. So that's one hat on. And also, because I had lots of students, one of the things I always did with my students when they got close to graduating was to tell them more. It was really important that the first thing they do when they graduate is apply for board certification and start working through the board certification process. Ali, uh, yeah. are, you, uh, so are you sharing or you are not sharing? Are oh, you sharing your screen? Yeah. I am. Is it, does anybody else not see my screen? Jeannie, do you see my screen? We are not no, seeing No, we don't screen. see your screen. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to start again then because I share, I thought I was sharing my screen. Let me try again. Could you try I'm again? my screen, share, okay. Okay, yeah, we'll see now you. this is sharing, yeah. Now we can yeah. see it, okay, good. <laughs> okay, let me uh, minimize this so we don't see that, you don't need to see that there. Okay, unfortunately, I've got this uh, panel on my right here. Somehow I need to get rid of it. Okay. As I mentioned, uh, we were the first ones to uh, get our programs accredited. And also, as Jeannie mentioned, I'm pre currently president of the IMPCB. So I have two reasons to be giving this talk. One is my past experience with graduate programs and lots of lots of graduate students coming through and convincing them to get accredited to, to get certified and getting our own program accredited and then um, the IMP cert, uh, uh, certification board because we're going to hear a lot about that from the other speakers today so why do we have certification well can you see the end of this sentence? I'm trying to get rid of this. How do I get? Ah, here we go. I'm just uh, bringing it up there now. Good. Why do we have certification? Because patients deserve and expect to be given the best care possible with the resources available. And that's the job of the medical physicist. Medical physicists, therefore, should have appropriate education and training. Medical physics education and training programs should meet appropriate standards. And I'm going to talk all about these as we go on. Medical physics certification boards should be capable of deciding if examinees have the required education, training, and experience to safely practice independently. So that's the purpose of certification. So what constitutes appropriate education and training. And there's a very good report on this from the IAEA, the uh, Human Health Series number 25. Take a look at that. Hopefully they'll convince you that, uh, that you can meet the requirements of qualified uh, medical physicists. So this recommends that a clinically qualified medical physicist, they call them CQMP, undergoes the following edu education and training. This is their recommendation. Firstly, a postgraduate degree in medical physics. And secondly, a period of structured clinical training in a hospital in one of the specialties of medical physics. So this is ideally what we should aim for, certainly in the future. So postgraduate degrees in medical physics, there's another publication from IAEA on academic programs. And take a look at that and you'll see that 
It reviews things like the admissions criteria for medical physicists, and the infrastructure of a, an academic program, and the core courses. It reviews all the courses that you should have as a core of a medical physics graduate program. And then how to assess and evaluate the candidates. Uh, program accreditation. It talks about getting your, um, say your master's program or your residency program, if you have one accredited. And I'll talk about accreditation in a moment. And uh, how many contact hours should you have for each course? Teaching contact hours for each course. And then it runs through a sample, typical sample program of a uh, graduate medical physics course. And all this is uh, available on the internet and here's the link to the internet. Just click on this and you should go to this publication. IOMP have a lot to say, of course, about um, academic programs. For instance, accreditation, the suitability of a certain educational program to provide the necessary academic knowledge could be established through a suitable national or international accreditation body. The IMPCB is an international accreditation body, but we don't accredit courses. We don't accredit educational programs. We accredit board certification programs. Several countries, regions have established such accreditation programs. This is for the teaching programs such as the IPEM and CAMPEP in the United States, IPEM in the United Kingdom. And internationally, the IOMP recently in 2017 formed an accreditation board to accredit educational and ready residency programs. So what is appropriate training? Medical physicists who have clinical responsibilities should have received, additionally to their education, clinical competency training. And this should be carried out under the direct supervision of a qualified medical physicist, specialized in the same subfield, or a qualified professional with a level of professional experience and expertise equivalent to a CQMP. And for an appropriate duration, the duration of the training program. So what is the appropriate duration of a clinical training program? According to the IOMP and incidentally also the IAEA, the duration of clinical competency training should not be less than two years full-time equivalent. Preferably in the form of a formal residency or an equivalent clinical training program. For those jurisdictions in which an accreditation program exists for residencies, the residency should be an accredited program. So if you have a residency, you should get it accredited if possible. Now, let me talk about certification. Medical physicists practicing in medical institutions or those with clinical responsibilities should be subject to professional certification. This is all from IOMP, IAEA documents. Medical physics organizations or health competent authorities should establish their own national professional certification systems to facilitate such process if possible. In countries where the establishment of such a national certification system is impractical, for instance, there aren't enough medical physicists to set it up, Considerations should be made to have their medical physicists certified by an appropriate external certification body, such as we're going to discuss today, the IMPCB. There's a new IAEA publication on all of this. This was just published a month ago, 2021. It's guidelines on the certification of clinically qualified medical physicists, CQMPs. It goes through the need and benefits of medical physics certification, guidelines on the establishment of national or regional certification schemes, if you don't have one, and it's endorsed 
not only by the IOMP and IMPC, but by also by the AAPM, which has many, many years of experience in having their, their medical physicists certified. And again, this is available from the IAEA, um, open access to everybody. What about maintenance of certification? Again, IOMP, a professional competency maintenance scheme should be implemented for clinically qualified medical physicists. This could be in the form of recertification after an appropriate period of time, maybe five or 10 years, and or participation in a mandatory continuing professional development program. So let's look at a CPD program. Medical physics organizations should establish and maintain their own national CPD systems to support the continual professional development of their members. In countries in which establishment of such a program is impractical, arrangements should be made for the medical physicist to enter a well-established external CPD system. Many continuing professional development events get accredited so that individuals can gain points while attending or participating in these educational or scientific events. So you have an annual meeting, you can get it accredited um, so that anybody attending the meeting can claim points for their attendance. The events need to be accredited by appropriate organizations. And the IOMP has recently initiated event accreditation. Um, CAMPAP in the USA has been doing this all over the world for many programs so that people can gain, uh, gain points, CPD points, uh, as demonstration that they're keeping up to date with their knowledge. So let's get back to the question that I'd like to convince you all about is why should medical physicists get certified? Well, in many countries or regions, in order to practice clinical medical physics independently, you need to be a CQMP. For instance, pretty much in the United States, it's hard to be to practice clinical medical physics if you're not board certified. And board certification is usually a requirement to be called a clinically qualified medical physicist. Um, that's, that's, it's, that's exactly what we have in the United States right now. And in many countries in the world, you need to be certified to become a qualified medical physic physicist to practice independently. What about additional incentives to individuals to get board certified? Well, in many countries, again, regulatory bodies require facilities to have CQMPs on staff to perform specific duties, such as quality assurance, radiation safety, etc. For instance, in the United States, um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission need to have a qualified medical physicist on staff before you can handle radioactive isotopes. Um, in my state, for instance, in Michigan, we started this many years ago that you couldn't buy a linear accelerator, for instance, if you didn't have a qualified medical physicist on your staff. And that meant a board certified medical physicist. So certification therefore enhances one's importance to your institution. It's good for your job security to be certified because you're important to your institution. It could be a stepping stone to promotion. You get certified, you can move up one step in, in the, on the stepping ladder. And this might actually be an incentive to increase your salary. I should say in my um, Wayne State University department, whenever somebody got certified, I went to the administrator and convinced them either to allow them to be promoted to the next step up on the ladder or increase their salary. So I use that as my reason to recommend an increase in position. And of course, it looks great on your CV to be board certified. How can all this be achieved? 
Well, countries need to establish programs to regulate who is qualified to practice medical physics independently. Accreditation of education and training programs is, should be part of a country's um, requirement if you're going to do this and certification by a local, regional or international board. So let me summarize my talk today. It is important that medical physicists become certified. Medical physics education and training programs should become accredited. Medical physicists in countries that do not currently have certification on accreditation programs should develop their own national programs if possible. And for countries where this is not yet possible, they should have their medical physicists certified by the IMPCB. And one of the major intents of IMPCB certification of medical physicists is that for each country, we will, we will have certified enough physicists to be able to go and set up their own certification board. And now I will be handing over to others like uh, Raymond Wood to explain to us all about the IMPCB. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Otten. Um, you've, thank you for the enlightening thought and certainly you've convinced me that it is very important to have certification for medical physics. Now our next speaker is Dr. Raymond Wu. He has obtained his BSc in physics from the Chinese University of Hong Kong and later his PhD in physics from the Dartmouth College, USA. He holds two specialty certifications from the American Board of Medical Physics, the inaugural certification in medical physics and the American Board of Radiology. Dr. Raymond Wu is currently the Chief Executive Officer of the um, IMPCB. So today, we would like to welcome Dr. Wu to tell us what is the, um, how did IMPCB came about? Dr. Wu? Thank you very much, Jeannie. Appreciate uh, the invitation. Uh, I would uh, like to start from uh, 1963 to talk about the, uh, how did we come to that our current stage. Now, 1963, the IAEA internal routine was uh, circulated within the IAEA. Now, IAEA you thought that they only do uh, atomic bombs. No, they really want to uh, focus also on medical use and other non-military use of atomic energy. And so in 1963, it uh, was talking about 20 years ago, very few people in the world heard of medical physics. So that was like 1920, subtract 20, so, so 1943. So, uh, so indeed IAEA is very serious in uh, trying to promote medical physics. Now, um, that's also the year that IOMP was formed. That's very interesting. IOMP was formed in 1963 also. Since it was formed, that there are plenty of uh, uh, discussions and uh, people in the medical physics field were thinking about that. Uh, there are a lot of concerns. A lot of concerns because of many uh, we feel that there are lack of appreciation being, being appreciated. We uh, feel that uh, the doctors are actually having a direct involvement with medical physics and just having the medical physicists work as a technician. And uh, the cost control control uh, gets to the point that uh, they would never get a promotion or increase in salary. And even the job title uh, has not been established in many countries. And therefore, it's difficult to attract people to come to the field. So you don't have enough uh, people. So people overwork and underpay, and then they isolate from peers. It's very serious in promoting 
uh, medical physics. And um, they formed the ICTP in 1964 uh, to allow the people from uh, developing countries to come to uh, Italy, ICTP, uh, to work together and learn. And this is a picture that you can see Colin and Thomas and also a whole group of uh, co-physics master degree. You know, they spent two years in ICTP and when they graduate, they get a second master's degree. They all come with a master's degree st to start with. And this is the lower floor. And uh, we, this might be right after one of our first exams uh, at the ICTP where IMPCP uh, deliver an examination. Now, there are many positive forces to help the medical physicists. Uh, like for example, the pattern of care studies of uh, uh, radiation oncology that they demand that uh, uh, there are research trials by many institutions and they all have to have the proper standard of practice and including the have a support of appropriate qualified medical physicists. So that helped uh, in the United States. Now, and then there are reports and publications and then the IOMP policy statements one and policy statements two help very much too. I'm gonna to talk about that. And particularly the IOMP newsletter articles people are writing about why can we uh, follow the examples of many Western countries uh, to establish a international board. So the IOMP formed a test group on medical physics certification board uh, to be uh, within the professional relations committee. And uh, at that time that uh, we already know uh, uh, the, there are many uh, ways and many models of getting some individuals medical physicists certified in different parts of the world and the united states has all these three phases through the years so uh, most at the beginning that the professional medical physics organization will set up a board and have exam and methods and decide and how to define who are uh, qualified enough to be certified. And this is, once they certify, they would just be, uh, because of they are better people, they are more qualified and they are actually recognized readily by hospitals and institutions. So these are volunteer, this is a voluntary model. So uh, in the US, we gone through that stage. And then when there are enough people in the field, there are enough people who are qualified, then the, the group together, they would seek the uh, directive in force. That's meaning that they would get the regulatory agency, just like Colin said that the NRC in the US would then gradually uh, understand that all oh, the board certified medical physicists really are better qualified and they should be automatically allowed to practice certain uh, tests, to do certain work in the clinic. And then of course, the third model is that in some of the states in the US, not everyone, that they are licensed. And these people, if you don't have a license, then you cannot practice. It would be illegal to practice. So that would be the best model that we would all want to achieve. So in the United States, since 1936, the RSNA already be began certifying medical physics. That's a long time ago, 1936, 80 years ago. And ABR then took over in 1949. And then 1949 to 1987, that almost 40 years, that the ABR was actually basically uh, controlled by a small group of doctors and small group of medical physicists. And then the ABMP and many medical physicists, uh, they uh, do not like that. And we would, for that time that the American College of Medical Physics was formed, 
and then created the ABMP in 1987. That the ABMP was entirely controlled by medical physicists and they know who should be qualified better than the medical doctors. But then uh, after doing that, uh, you know that in 1987, there was a pretty, uh, 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 from 1987 to 2001, that is the time when the ABMP and the ABR got together and then decided that they do not want to uh, continue uh, to have uh, some, uh, you know, an uh, easiness between the two boards. That then they would uh, combine together and decided and agree that the ABMP would not certify the, uh, the normal three fields anymore. Uh, the diagnostic radiation oncology and nuclear medicine physics. Those fields would be left for the ABR. And then the ABMP would just focus on MRI and health physics. And that is an agreement with ABR. And then the two certificates, they have uh, mutual uh, acceptance, mutual uh, recognition. And then the next major difference is 2014, the major improvement. Uh, ABR decided that all candidates must be from MPEP accredited programs. Colin talk about accredited program. Now, accreditation is focused on programs. So accreditation is for programs such as certification program or training program, that's accreditation. But for certification, that is for individuals. So the individuals would have to be uh, educated in a good quality education program in their master's degree and in their clinical training. Now, that is how we're going to do that in the international uh, uh, applicants because of uh, all the CAMPAP programs are in the United States. So the many leaders internationally that they know about that and ahead of time, and uh, even as early as 2008, uh, the American College of Medical Physics was uh, requested to help uh, look into establishing a international board. Now that was before MPCB was formed. And uh, there was a, in Seattle, a uh, the first International Medical Physics Symposium. The title is Symposium on Certification of Experienced Clinical Medical Physicists and International Cooperative Effort. That is the title. And at that time, the education and training programs in different countries, Korea, China, Taiwan, Japan, Asia, Mexico, and Latin America, and they were sharing each other's experience on training. And actually the abstracts may be viewed in the impcb.org in the website. You can click and look at the abstracts and the panelists and at that particular symposium focuses on education and training. And then the following year, again, ACMP organized the second International Medical Physics Symposium that was in Virginia. I was actually working in, in Virginia at that time. And the theme of that symposium was creating an international medical physics certification board. So we are talking about the board now. And then at that time, there are many boards already in existence in the world, like in Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong, Japan, Canada, Brazil, India, Poland, Middle East, uh, there's a uh, 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 in, intention of doing that, but of course, United States. So, and uh, the abstracts and handouts may always, uh, again, that uh, can be viewed in the IMPCB uh, website. And at that time that we uh, discussed about the role of CAMPAP and realized that uh, CAMPAP is going to be a, a, stump, a, a barrier for international applicants. So at that time also uh, the constitution panel of the board, independent of uh, IOMP and uh, 
IMPCP. Uh, but, uh, but that constitution panel later on was adopted, their work was adopted by IMPCP and accepted. And that IPMP, the constituting panel was led by Ed Sternick with members like uh, Maria Esther from Mexico, K.Y. Chen from Hong Kong, Ibrahim from uh, Lebanon, and Professor Hu from China, Siung Kim from U.S., and Charlie from Thailand, Joseph from uh, Czech Republic, Erwin from Canada, Tim Sober from United States, Taesuk Su from Korea, Arun from India, and Sunda from uh, U.S. So this had some uh, 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 success. And then in 2009 in Munich, that's a major advance of, uh, pro, uh, of creating the international board because of uh, funding was important. So there was this concept of charter organization announced that charter organization will limit only to 11, 10 organization, medical physical, and they all have to, each one have to contribute 100 US dollars to 500 US dollars. If the organization really want a medical physics certification board, then put in some funding. So we end up having 10 organizations plus one more, that's 11 actually. So we have more than we want. And then also the IOMP executive committee at the time, uh, Fritjol, KY, Slavic, Matan, Barry Allen, Don Fry, Bill Handy, and uh, Mario Doc. Carmo Lopez from uh, Portugal and Harold from US and Peter Smith from the United Kingdom. And then uh, we discussed about the different models, just like I described. And we got very strong support by IAEA participants. And then at that time also, it was proposed to use the name called IMPCB, International Medical Physics Certification Board, and a report was given to the IUPESM, which is the organizer above IOMP. They are the organization above IOMP and they have Council One and in the Council One, the report was made. And then the following year, 2010 was also a major milestone. And that is time when we actually established the IMPCB, that we have the third International Medical Physics Symposium it was held in San Antonio in May 25th, 2010. It was jointly sponsored by three organizations, ACMP, AAPM, IOMP. And before the symposium, the voting persons of the charter member organization met two times and made the following resolutions. Adopt the name, so that name was fixed. And then consider 2010 May to be the official formation date and in fact, the abstracts, the handout, and even the video recording for all presentations are still available in the IMPCB.org. Thanks to uh, Timothy Chang, he is actually in the audience. He did work so hard and get all this video uh, recorded. That was uh, 2010. Now, uh, I just want to go to uh, the website and point out that uh, you can see all those histories at the foot menu, the footer menu of the International Board's website. And in the website that you can click, and then actually now we are just clicking to that page, ICMP in United Kingdom. And that was the International Conference on Medi Medical Physics 2013. In that meeting that we already had the bylaws uh, accepted, and then we just discuss how do we do the nomination and election and how do we do the stacker term uh, because of uh, we have this uh, special three-year term for every elected office holders. Three-year term and we will get lost very easily. So there's a way using color code and you can actually easily go to the uh, website and see who is on 
the first term, first year term or second year or third year. And then the nomination election committee can easily decide who is up for re-election or for uh, the replacement. So these major milestones are in the IOMP website and then, the, but then I just highlight the recent ones. The recent one would be the ILO document. Now, everyone would really should look into this document. It's freely downloadable. And this document defines who is this medical physicist and what are their work supposed to be. And this medical physicist is supposed to have a code that is like the physics, physicists and astronomers that starts with two something, 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 four, four letter code, I mean four digit code, start with two. And so is the radiation oncologists and radiologists and pharmacists, they all start with two. And then there are technologies too. The technologies and uh, radiation oncology therapists and the nuclear medicine technologies, their code in the ILO start with three. So three something, something, something. So it's a four digit code also. And so if your organization, your hospital says that I never heard of medical physicists, then ask them to download the ILO and look at 2111. That's the code for medical physicists. And then they also can go to IOMP and download the policy statement one and two. And these are very important statements. And then the, at that time, educational requirements are already quite well harmonized over the world. And we all have to have a master's degree and the, and the undergraduate has to have a physics and core courses and mathematics core courses. And they don't have to be a physicist major, but they could be an engineer as long as they take all those courses. And they could be medical physics major as long as they take all those core courses. And then the clinical element has to be incorporated. So, and then at that time also IOMP as the principal supporting organization was established and the bylaws was amended and it was a work led by Colin Orton and KY Chung and Thomas, uh, Thomas Cron and uh, other people. And this is the memorandum of understanding between IOMP and IMPCB. And that is what I said that at that time, the year was uh, 2014 and there was form a test group to work on that. And then uh, in 2015, that the bylaw has to be changed. The IOMP bylaw has to be changed and the work led by Colin and, uh, and KY was the one signing this memorandum on behalf of IOMP and Colin was signing this on behalf of IMPCB in 2015. That's done in Beijing. So in that memorandum, it says that IMPCB will focus on standardization and like accreditation of certification programs in accordance with IOMP guidelines. So accreditation is for programs, accreditation of programs. And IOMP provides supports through the scientific and education program for continuing professional development. And IOMP would accredit the scientific and educational programs. So they would focus on programs, just like IMPCB would focus on accreditation of programs. But then there are, besides accreditation, which we have done since 2014, and the first one was approved in 2015, that is the Korean uh, certification board. And then we also have direct certification exams and certification program is for individual candidates would be coming from but they don't have local certification boards. And we started that since 2017. And we don't expect that we can start. We thought that maybe 2018 or maybe 2019, but we have to 
hard work of the accreditation committee led by Thomas Cron. He must have many nights without sleep and to get all those procedures written and agreed on by the accreditation committee. And this was the first accreditation site visit in 2015 in Korea. See and Colin and myself and the two from Korea. And now that as of today, actually as of February, 2021, we have 40 fully certified uh, medical physicists certified by IMPCB. And we allow them to call diplomates of IMPCB. So they can put the IMPCB behind their name as a title. And they come from 20 different countries including Bangladesh, China, Ecuador, Egypt. Yeah, so many countries in the world. And from, from Asia, we have Bangladesh, China, India, uh, and um, Malaysia, yeah, and uh, Nepal, Pakistan. So there are many countries in the Asia area that uh, is, on the average, there are two of them who got certified by IMPCB. So the summary of recent work established on that day, 2010, as you said, we have 11 charter members, you know, these people, this is uh, Brazil, America, this is uh, Australia, Chinese, this is Chinese from Taiwan, and this is uh, Mexico, Hong Kong, this is uh, Iraq, uh, this is uh, Korea, and Lebanon and uh, Nepal. So the model certification program was adopted in 2011, bylaws adopted in 2012, and then later on we have to change when we put uh, IOMP, the principal supporting organization. And then officers elected to take office starting in 2014. And the first local board accreditation was given to uh, Korea in 2015, and the first direct exam was in 2017. So the conclusion is that clinical medical physics practice is challenging. You no longer can, the medical doctors no longer feel comfortable to, to do the work of medical physics, and they do need qualified medical physicists. So everywhere is demanding and asking and looking for people who are certified uh, by IMPCB and by other major boards. And the quality medical physics support is key to quality, quality health care. And IMPCB were entirely run by volunteers. And the volunteers feel very happy that we can all help. And we also feel that the work should continue. And then the alumni those people who got board certified, like that we have four, 40 of them now, and they are stakeholders and they are expected to uphold the standards in the future. So that is the talk for me and uh, let me uh, give the time for uh, back to Ginny. Thank you, Dr. Raymond Wu. That was very, very inspiring and motivating. And certainly at the work of IMPCB has come a long way since it first uh, set up. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Thomas Krohn. Uh, Thomas Krohn is the Director of Physical Science at the Peter McCallum Cancer Center. He was born and educated in Germany. After his PhD, he migrated to Australia where he started his career in radiotherapy physics. He is currently the lead of the nomination and election committee of the IMPC. Dr. Krohn, can you share with us the first 10 years of the IMPC? And going forward from here, what's your thoughts and plans? Uh, thank you very much, Jenny, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really honored to have the opportunity here to spend about 10 minutes uh, to talk about IMPCB. I'm 
obviously very passionate about uh, that idea. And I, I think the presentations you have heard by Colin Orton and Raymond Wu really have set the stage uh, very nicely of what has happened in that last couple of years. I will, though, also spend 10 uh, minutes not just to look at the past 10 years, but also at the next 10 years, or at least had take a glimpse into the future and try that to do that in 10 slides. So that's probably uh, one of the more difficult tasks uh, we can have. I might share my full screen with you uh, for this uh, presentation. So if you want to know about the IMPCB, there is a recent publication uh, in Medical Physics International Journal, uh, which provides these 10 years of their past history. And uh, uh, Raymond has already given a wonderful uh, so, uh, overview uh, over that. Uh, there's a table which lists much less uh, explicit uh, the uh, main key events in IMPCB's history. These are the uh, two pictures of the certification uh, uh, of IOMP uh, 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 of IMPCB uh, at the IOMP World Congress in Prague, uh, and uh, also a picture of their first accreditation uh, in Korea, which uh, uh, Raymond has already talked about. You can also see here uh, in this context that IMPCB has both a very formal way of addressing things and an informal way. And I should encourage you or everyone who is interested in certification uh, and not part of a, uh, of a country where a certification board exists to approach us informally uh, and see how you fit in there. And I saw just one of the chats already uh, pertains to one of these questions. So we have now 40 colleagues who are accredited, uh, 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 certified, uh, and four boards which are uh, accredited. We held examinations all over the world, uh, from uh, Bangladesh to Mexico uh, and uh, uh, many other countries, uh, and uh, we are starting to collect interesting data. These are 153 uh, people who set the first uh, part of the exam uh, and Adel will talk a bit more about uh, the actual structure of the exam and you can see that things are sort of from a statistics perspective nearly Gaussian distributed which is actually really what you would like to see. So I think we can, by looking at our data, do two things. We are supporting the medical physics uh, community and medical physics overall, as is our uh, object uh, for the uh, organization, but we also obtain valuable data, valuable data to inform health policy uh, all over the world uh, and compare and, and allow us to compare the status and standard of medical physics all over the world. Uh, and you can see that the tools we are using uh, in terms of the examination by its nature should be somewhere Gaussian distributed. That's what you expect of good exam practice. And indeed, that is sort of the case with 50% being the cutoff. So you can see that these exams, we do have people who failed. And that's sort of something you would probably also expect in these type of examinations because you want to make sure that who passes the exam uh, is really supporting medical physics practice very well and can be seen from outside from people who are not familiar with medical physics practice as someone who is really up to uh, the highest standards one can think of. So if I look at the future, uh, I want to share a quick SWOT analysis. And SWOT analysis is, is something you learn at middle management school. It's sort of something you typically do when you start a new job. Uh, it's typically something you do when you uh, get involved in a new project. So let me have a quick look at the SWOT uh, analysis of IMPCB. So strengths and weaknesses uh, refer to existing features of an organization. And there's absolutely no doubt that uh, there is a real need for certification. We have a high, highly dedicated CEO and, and president. And uh, I, I think these people have really made, made the organization uh, 
to that what it is now. There are excellent board members. It is now a mature organization after 10 years and it uh, enjoys excellent links to other organizations, which I think is really, really important because certification doesn't stand alone. It is part of an accreditation environment of standards uh, and uh, of an international uh, uh, a process which leads to guidelines and hopefully at some point in time to some uh, uh, legal or regulatory in, in involvement. And then there are weaknesses uh, that we really rely on many of these strengths. There's no fixed income uh, and uh, the diversity is something we are working on. If you look, however, in terms of strength, there is this recent publication of IAEA uh, where IMPCB was very much involved in uh, uh, drafting and uh, putting this together. And you can see that these are the sort of benefits everyone sees for the uh, person who undertakes the uh, exam, but also for patients and society and for the healthcare service, ranging from reputation, best use of technology, best practice and ethical issues. The SWOT analysis, though, also looks into the future and the things there to look for out for would be opportunities and threats. The opportunities are clearly that there is going to be more need uh, for uh, certified physicists. No one from the public can tell that this is a good physicist, that's a bad physicist. This is the physicist who should plan my father's treatment, radiotherapy treatment, or this is a physicist who should not. In order to allow that, we do need that certification. There's a link to remuneration, uh, as Colin has uh, 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 alerted to. And I think that is clearly something which will ensure that we get the best people also appropriately remunerated. And uh, we do see an increasing visibility uh, with an increasing number of colleagues who are certified. There are threats. Succession, as a voluntary organization, we do rely uh, on people putting up their hands. Uh, and uh, I think I'm really gratified to, to say that uh, so far, uh, people have been absolutely wonderful in uh, supporting this organization. There are significant resources required, though, and huge tasks ahead, in particular in the area of CPD. What is, however, uh, very encouraging is this emerging community of IMPCB uh, diplomats. Then since this year, we have an alumni group uh, and uh, 39 out of 40 uh, of the colleagues have actually agreed and expressed an interest to be part of that. That is a forum for discussion, sharing of resources and a, a chat, but it's also a sounding board, a sounding board for people who may want to set up new certification boards. It's an opportunity uh, for us to get together and discuss how we can make uh, medical physics uh, better and also how we can communicate medical physics uh, to the world, which is really part of the motto of the this year's uh, International Week of Medical Physics and International Day of Medical Physics. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, obviously the work included many, many people, as you can see here. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Krohn. Certainly, you managed to deliver your 10 minutes talk, 10 minutes slides in 10 minutes. Congratulations. He Thank walks that, the talk. That, that's not required for certification, uh, I should say that, but it does help. <laughs> but thank you very much again. Um, so our last speaker, certainly not the least, we have with us uh, Dr. Adal Mustafa. Dr. Adal Mustafa uh, holds a faculty position at the Yale University School of Medicine. He's board certified by both the American Board of Radiology and the American Board of Medical Physics in Diagnostic Imaging Physics. So many years he has been, he had been serving as co-chair, chair of the several AAPM, Scientific and Professional Committees, and examiner for the American Board of Radiology. So he's here today as the chief examiner and the chair of accreditation committee of the IMPCB. Dr. Mustafa, can you tell us how does IMPCB work? If we want to obtain IMPCB certification or accreditation, 
how should we go about it? Well, uh, thank you, Jeannie, for this introduction. And uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, Ramadan Mubarak for those who are enjoying Ramadan these days. And I'd like also to thank my colleagues who preceded me in leveling the grants for me to uh, give uh, this kind of uh, hopefully quick presentation. I'll try to keep to my 20 minutes as much as possible as well. So to start with, I'd really like to uh, look here at the objectives of this discussion today. And I'm going to focus on two components of the discussion. One, introducing AC accreditation operations, how we go about accrediting organizations who are interested in getting our accreditation uh, internationally. Uh, through looking at the accreditation requirements, how the application process goes, as well as the application structure. Then after that, for those who would uh, be interested in getting the certification exam, for obvious reasons, which is the lack of uh, national accreditation programs, accredited programs, then we're going to uh, allow them to enter those exams and go to uh, detail some of the exams uh, components and the categories, the admission requirements, the process itself, and the completion of the board uh, once you meet all the requirements above. Uh, just to introduce uh, my current committee, the Accreditation Committee, the committee works with national organizations that offer or planning to offer um, uh, certified medical physicist certification, in other words, apology for the type there. And I'm not going to go over that in any details, being actually covered nicely. Uh, model program in MPCP also can be found on the MPCB website. So if you'd like to look at those model programs, that would be really a place for you to go to. There are maybe also some deviations or slight variations from the uh, model program. And those variations are um, things that uh, we look at at the accreditation committee and try to accommodate based on local educational and legislative issues. So in some countries, um, uh, we can uh, give some kind of leeway uh, for those countries in certain aspects of the accreditation, accreditation process without violating the spirit of the process process itself. We get applications from recognized organizations with professional structures. We really need to know the um, nature of those entities that they are applying, what is their national role, and what are their approaches in getting their candidates or applicants uh, qualified and, and meet the requirements for training as well as for certification to become true medical physics professionals. There is a timeline on reviews and approval, and from the time you apply until you get um, the accreditation process, we actually go into some kind of iterations before the final approval, which basically means that we're going to look at the application, go through it in some details with our committees. We have three committees for that purpose. And then after that, we um, I give you some questions or follow-ups or asking for clarifications, and then you answer back. Most of the time that really happens, you may actually go further for further questions or settle out with what you are uh, uh, giving us. Uh, we might actually do, which in the past we did, site visits by MPCP delegates. We send two or three people from the MPCP to visit those sites. We actually stopped doing this because of the COVID situation. But in the future, that may be also a possibility of those who are applying would possibly expect to get also a visit from a delegation from the association, from, from the board. It may take a minimum of three months before we can actually get you the approval. Um, the standard time would possibly be about three to six months, sometimes because of difficulty of communications. And uh, when we send things back for clarifications, they take a longer time to get the answers back and so on. So it, it varies. And um, in the spirit of cooperation, we both try to do our best uh, as the uh, board, as well as the applicants, uh, to speed up the process of getting the accreditation as soon as possible. 
Accreditation could be uh, full or conditional, uh, full meaning that you get your accreditation for the period of time mentioned in the certificate, or it might be actually conditional saying that uh, I will give you the accreditation providing that you do one, two, three things. Uh, you either adjust it or change it, modify it, and then we'll follow up with you in a specific period of time that will we agree upon. Uh, most accreditation come for a period of five years, could be less uh, um, before recertification uh, is issued. And would also get a follow-up evaluation or annual report, something that we are working on. We haven't really uh, got uh, to the point where we uh, are asking uh, the accredited uh, countries to provide us with those reports yet, but it's something that is coming uh, soon. What are the requirements? Well, we are trying to align ourselves with what has been mentioned earlier, which are the IMP guidelines and policies on IP education and training, and uh, also the new IA guidelines, report said 71, for the accreditation of clinically qualified medical physicists. So a lot of details can be found in those reports, so I need not know to go into the details there, except the fact that when we look at accreditation of particular organizations, we look at their educational requirements, just to make sure that those requirements meet the standards as outlined by IMP, IEEA, as well as by us, because we also added or maybe have a different spin on those IMP, IA requirements. Uh, professional training requirements is another component of the process. And also we really like to know more about the professional structure uh, with sufficient quality uh, medical physicists. You have to have enough people to carry this program in your country with proper qualification and as well education in the field. So what you should really have in your application, this is a, a list of these items. And as a matter of fact, under each one of those items, there are maybe five or six points of details. But I just quickly mention them. You need to have a covering letter or a cover letter with the uh, contact details who's going to be responsible for this, uh, whom we want to um, talk in the future. You talk to us about your organization. Uh, that is applying, and also the certification body that's going to be responsible for uh, carrying the certification process in your country. A list of specialty, uh, specialists, or specialties rather, of medical physics for which you are um, offering, going to be offering. Are you going to do only therapy, diagnostic, nuclear medicine, maybe even radiation protection in the future and so on? So it have to be clear as to what you're going to, or you are applying for. Number of certified medical physicists in each special uh, specialty category, if you're going to apply for diagnostic physics, you need to have a certain number of certified medical physicists um, who are going to be able to uh, do the education and the training and to go be the mentors and preceptors uh, for your candidates in the future. Also, a bit about your legal status, the regulatory status of the certification process within your country itself and also uh, within the education framework and the health system maybe. So that may be another dimension of the application. We need to know a bit about qualifications and experiences uh, required from applicants for certification. So you are applying or you're accepting somebody to in your program. What are the bases for accepting that person, that individual in your program? And also details of your certification program. How are you going to do the training uh, and how many years, uh, the different steps? What are the competencies that you are going to require from your candidates to meet in year one and year two? And also so how are you going to evaluate them? What is the mechanism for, for instance, uh, them to approach you as the organizers, as well as, as the mentors and preceptors and so on? It's quite detailed a bit there. Then we need a copy of, of documents you give to candidates. When you communicate with them, you talk to them about certain aspects of the program. We need to see what you are actually saying to them. And also description of the CPD, the future CPD as mentioned earlier. And communications and methods. How do you communicate with them? You send them letters, uh, emails uh, uh, maybe. Uh, so um, it's, it's important that we know uh, maybe you have a website or something like this that the condition committee would like to know how you go about these things. There are three subcommittees within uh, the AC, the Accreditation Committee, AC 1, 2, and 3, and those are aligned with the exams. We have three exams, part 1, part 2, and part 3, and therefore each one of those subcommittees will look into what is of interest to them in that particular application.
Uh, the review results, we issue a report at the end of the process, and we may actually say the program is accredited as is, meaning everything is fine, great, no need for anything else. Um, we may also ask for clarification uh, for specified points before recommending accreditation. We may ask for also recommend the uh, minor modifications prior to acceptance for accreditation, or maybe even major modifications. We may say this requires really a lot of work and we have to go back to the drawing board and give us really more of what we are asking you to give. There will be occasions also when the application is totally rejected because the, the spirit of it or also the line uh, of uh, that, uh, the direction of that application is not really consistent with accreditation programs and also training programs for certification book. And with that, of course, we'll give you some kind of direction as to how to go about this process and improve it. The exams. This is now the uh, second component of this certification exams path. If you choose to take that path in countries where you don't have a certification program, then of course uh, this is applicable to those medical physicists with no access to national or regional certification. So this is an individual application. It is not national, it's not regional, it's not a country, it is a person who is applying for the certification exam uh, to, to the MPCP. The application should submit candidate credential to establish eligibility a few months before the exam. So we really need to know what are the basis for you applying for the exam, for the uh, board exam in there. And also, so we can establish your uh, eligibility. Uh, you must pass the three exam parts before certification. We cannot you consider you board certified or the applicant board certified unless you pass three parts of the exam. Written part one, general physics, this is really basically what it is, and also some kind of introductory health science with radiobiology, health sciences including a bit of anatomy, basic anatomy, uh, structure and function physiology, and then a bit of radiobiology as well. Uh, at the level of a master degree program. Then we also have the, the part two exam, which is a written exam as well, it is the medical physics specialty. It is written in your specialty, diagnostic therapy, nuclear medicine. And you need uh, with that to have some kind of specific knowledge across your discipline in multiple uh, areas or multiple uh, uh, categories of the discipline will have to be probed and will have to be examined in that uh, in that forum. And then of course the oral part. And the oral part, providing that you pass part one and two, you will be allowed to get into the uh, uh, on that part. It's a one-on-one -on -one exam. And it is to look at your clinical medical physics abilities, professional judgment, as well as your communication skills as a medical physicist if you were to apply to us. Um, other specialties, the specialties we are covering nowadays, as I said, include radiation oncology physics, medical imaging and interventional radiology physics, and then in nuclear medicine physics. In the future, we are considering radiation protection, radiation safety as our number four. The two active ones currently are radiation oncology and medical imaging, and we will soon start the nuclear medicine physics. We are preparing for that um, discipline as well coming up soon. In the part two and part three exams, um, we expect to test you in certain competencies, including fundamental modality knowledge to understand really what this is all about. And also the ability to apply your knowledge to the clinical environment. And also we expect you that to master the quality and safety expectations from each one of those modalities uh, that you are applying to work with. Uh, and the oral exam must pass and before getting into the oral exam, must pass, or rather, uh, to pass the oral exam, you must pass every category in the specialty exam. Each category is, is each modality is divided, or exam is divided into five categories, and you must pass every single one before you qualify for the certification. Here is a sample of the or the list of uh, exam categories. Uh, category one in radiation therapy, for instance, it covers radiation protection and patient safety, and then category two, patient related measurement and three, image acquisition processing and display. In four, calibration, quality control, and quality assurance. And in category five, equipment. We're talking about radiotherapy equipment, understanding those equipment, operation, quality assurance, and all that, patients related dosimetry as well. 
For diagnostic exams in category one, you should really, uh, you will be examined on, again, this is the uh, uh, part one and two, radiation biology, dosimetry, protection and safety. In category two, informatics, image display, image fundamentals, professionalism and ethics. In category three, general radiography, mammography, fluoroscopy and interventional imaging. Uh, CT is a full category, so as ultrasound and MRI as non-ionizing radiation um, modalities. In nuclear medicine, which will be starting soon, uh, you need to have uh, understanding of concepts and applications of patient safety and radiation protection, working with radioactive materials, understanding how these radioactive materials are created, made, uh, and, and used. Uh, full category for PET and hybrids associated with PET imaging. Another category for uh, uh, single photon imaging system, um, uh, SPECT and SPECT CT, uh, looking also at gamma cameras, uh, solid state detectors cameras, as well as hybrids that have a mix with cameras and CTs. Category four irradiation measurements, and that includes those calibrators and counters, survey meters, and so on. And that also has some issues with radiation safety associated with those. And then, of course, clinical procedures. You'd have to know where those applications are going to go. Here's a, a, a glimpse of what is in part one and uh, your eligibility for part one. So to, 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 uh, if, to be eligible to get into part one, you need to have a certain level of education. You need to have to have a BS degree from an accredited academic program in physics, medical physics, or appropriate physics or engineering sciences. In addition, you have to have a master or PhD from accredited academic program in physics, medical physics, or appropriate physics or engineering science as well. And uh, um, this is important that you get engineering science has also to be related to medical physics. You have to have really some connection to medical physics. There are no specific um, uh, requirements for uh, professional training for part one of the exam. The exam is composed of 100 multiple choice questions, and it is conducted over three hours. It is usually under, uh, done under proctorship. We did it in the past uh, with a proctor. Nowadays, we are thinking or trying to do it over Zoom, uh, but it's something in the making. For part two of the exam, which is also a written exam, um, education, you have to meet part one requirements. But in case professional training, you have minimum of two years full-time training preceding application date. Uh, you have to have this particularly in the area of medical physics. And also you have to have that training under a certified medical physics or someone with equivalent professional experience in the same specialty. If you are doing diagnostic medical physics certification or requiring that, then in this case, the qualified medical physics should be also in that particular area. Similarly, there are going to be 100 questions in that exam, multiple choice, as well as three hours. Uh, historically, we did it. Um, uh, um, in person, and now we are considering the Zoom considerations, uh, the Zoom possibilities as well. The oral exam part three is the eligibility for getting into that is you must have passed parts one and two. It's not enough to pass either one or two, but both of them. And there is a minimum of at least three months uh, to get into part three before, uh, after you finish part one. So it's not like jumping from part two and a week later you go into part three. There should be enough time uh, sufficient to prepare yourself for the part three, uh, the oral exam. Uh, it has some also logistics because uh, you have still to apply to part three and that takes usually two months and for us at the board to uh, review your application and so on and so forth. Uh, the oral exam composed of five exam specialty categories, and then you're going to meet uh, in person five examiners. You're going to spend 25 minutes with each examiner, and each examiner will ask you five questions in the five categories of that specialty. The total exam time is about two and a half hours, and the exam results are usually announced within one month of the exam date. We historically did this in, in person, but now we are actually doing this uh, over Zoom. So oral exams are conducted, have been actually conducted during last year over Zoom. So re-examinations, uh, re-examinations for a candidate have three attempts for each part. You can do part one three times, part two three times, and so on. No more, three, no more than three times. But if a candidate fails 
part three, then in this case, you need to spend more clinical training in the specialty for about nine to 12 months. Um, so if one fails part three, which is the oral board, then the examiners, the panel, will decide well, this, whether this candidate is going to come after nine months or 12 months, depending on the degree of failing that exam. If it's severe, then we'll say, well, you really need more time to prepare on the study. That's a 12-month uh, period, waiting period. If not, then we actually come after nine months as the minimum. If any part of the examination has been taken unsuccessful three times, so if one fails part one three times or part two three times or even part three, then the candidate should be required to reapply. To reapply means you submit a new application altogether. For the entire exam, you have to repeat part one and two and three as well uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, requirement. A candidate who fails part, uh, any part of the three parts examination may petition, you have that uh, possibility, to be re-examined in that particular part within one year from the previous attempt. There is also a requirement for CPD, as it's been mentioned earlier. That's something we've just formulated a committee within the AC uh, to look on how we're going to institute this uh, process, and then we think we're going to be ready within a year or so uh, from the work uh, of this particular committee. In summary, MPC objective, objective, as been mentioned several times by McLuhan here, is to help advance the clinical and professional understanding of uh, established or new recruits in medical physics by developing and testing their competencies and skills. I uh, brought this from uh, Dr. Thomas and also uh, testing their up-to-date knowledge in the specialty, honesty and professionalism. It's very crucial that we have a feel of how those medical physicians are going to conduct themselves in the field, and assurance, meaning confidence in themselves, and transparency, honesty as well, as we mentioned earlier. And with that, I'd like to conclude and thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Adel. Um, that was very um, succinct and clear that how to how one should go about um, trying to achieve uh, certification and accreditation of program. So um, now we will now open for a question from the floor. And actually, there's already a couple of questions being submitted in the question and answer tab. And I think they have been answered, but I'll just read them out anyway, just for everyone who are not able to see the question. So what are the best steps for Malaysian working medical physicists with five years, more than five years work experience with masters from an accredited master's program to get board certified? And Dr. Thomas has said that it appears that this person would qualify for the IMPCD certification so welcome to apply to get certified under IMPCB. Uh, Dr. Thomas Krohn is the nomination and election committee. So he's the person who actually recommend people who, who uh, to, to sit for this exam. Is that right? No? No. Um, you are muted. No, it, it, it is not the nomination and election committee. It's an internal uh, structure. Uh, it, it is my role to uh, organize that next year we still have all the volunteers and all office holders in place. Oh, okay. So Sorry, the accreditation yeah. committee needs to be a, a, approached. Okay. But okay. What you said, Jenny, yeah, but what you said, Jenny, yeah, but what you said, Jenny, is correct. And it seems that uh, this candidate uh, qualifies since uh, he or she has had five years of experience as well as uh, came from an accredited program uh, in medical physics, so uh, they can apply. Yeah, so, so welcome to uh, look into IMPCB and try to apply for that. And certainly Dr. Mustafa has just answered that they are up to three times per exam part. If you fail once, you can you know, try again two times. So I think um, that gives us a lot of more confidence to you know, give it a go. Um, just on that question, um, may I know how much is the cost for the, to apply for certification? It's not yeah, a lot of money, but uh, Raymond. <laughs> right, yes. Uh, part one is 100 US dollars. Part two is also 100 US dollars. Part three is a little more expensive. It's a $350, 350. 
So altogether, it is uh, $550 to go through the whole process. Thank you, Dr. Wu. I think that's uh, 100, 100, 300. That's, uh, um, it's not too expensive, I believe. If you're working, you, we can actually, you know, that's not too much of a cost. Now, um, I do have um, some question here that I, I hope the panelists can help to clarify. Um, I think in the beginning, um, Dr. Colling mentioned that the, the IMPCB is endorsed by APM and IAEA. Um, I've, I'm just wondering, so does that mean that the, the IAEA certification system and the IMPCB and APM, they recognize each, all of this accreditation? And therefore, for example, if we want to set up an accreditation board in Malaysia, uh, we have some people that is certified under IAEA, some under IP, IMPCB. Can they all come together to set up the accreditation board? For the educational program, uh, I think that uh, they recognize each other. Yes, that answers yes. How about for the training? Pro the training program also. I would think that there's not too much of a problem for different organizations to recognize each other. Now, the ABR is a little tougher. ABR would only recognize the CAMPAP approved programs. So uh, <clears throat> that is if you have to apply and take the board exam for ABR. Right. I, I may say there is now a newly established IC International Committee within the AAPM and through this committee work and collaboration with CAMPAB, we are trying to get CAMPAB also to get involved internationally and um, through possibly IMPCP, but that's really something that may actually take some time before we could convince CAMPAB to um, either get directly involved or, uh, if you like, recognize uh, those programs that are accredited by International Medical Physics Certification Board. This is a promise. It is not something that's going definitely to happen, but it is something that we are working in one of our committees at the AAPM level. And may I also add to this that the uh, new IAEA document uh, the report 71 has a section on equivalence of certification, uh, which basically says uh, more or less what uh, Dr. Mustafa has said. Uh, in terms of, in principle, yes, in practice, this is a much more difficult uh, uh, scenario because particularly uh, certification boards which have achieved national recognition, so they are part of a regulatory framework uh, or a licensing system, uh, they cannot uh, approve other uh, certifications as identical. In addition to that, uh, there is typically a local contents pertaining to radiation safety uh, regulations and legal requirements, which is not identical across all over the world, as, as we know. So uh, the spirit and the idea is identical. And as an employer, I am very happy with people who are certified to ACPSM level or equivalent, but this equivalent is something which needs to be established in each individual case. Right, so that's, uh, that means that uh, some of this needs to be uh, individually case by case terming. Um, thank you, Thomas. Um, there is a question in the box that says, in Malaysia, there's about 50% of the workforce graduate from a nuclear or medical radiation program that has had a smaller physics content in the degree. So they're not based Bachelor of Physics. Um, so uh, they're about one semester or less. Okay. So then they often continue with a degree, a master degree in medical physics for one year. So the question is, are they eligible for part one? So I think- um, They will not, uh, unless that they have taken uh, the core courses or remedial courses, you know, right. that, uh, catch up with those basic physics courses. Right. 
uh, yes, physics and mathematics too. So, so that that means that uh, the IMPC board uh, who accept people to 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 take these exams will scrutinize their transcript to to determine the eligibility of the the candidates. Yeah, they have to submit the transcripts. So every course, how many credits? So the transcripts for the okay. undergraduate courses. Yeah. That's important. Right. So, um, the, Dr. Hafei say that thanks for the talk, there's a requirement for two years clinical teaching for part two. In some countries, a formal clinical training doesn't exist, but has many years, but they may have many years of working experience. How can one obtain this or provide different evidence to show competency to take part two? Um, and on, on, on the same line of that, for example, so in Malaysia, some because we don't have a, a proper certification program, so a medical physicist could work in diagnostic in the hospital in the diagnostic department for a few years and then move on to radi radiotherapy department for a few years and then nuclear medicine or in the regulatory for a few years. So they kind of hop around uh, just as the ministry send them around. So they may not have sufficient work experience in a particular field with a with a certified uh, uh, supervisors of that field. Um, do you have any, anyone wants to answer to that question? Well, I'm glad, Raman. Yeah, that is the decision, of course, uh, case by case uh, by the uh, accreditation committee. And the accreditation committee of, uh, would would consider whether those uh, work experience is equivalent uh, to uh, to the base to, to the training required, uh, right. and then if the ruling is uh, not not agree on, then the person can appeal. Right. Yeah, then the appeal process would involve uh, uh, Dr. Colin Orton and uh, the uh, accreditation committee and. So uh, in a couple of instances, it had been overruled that, uh, that it was they were, they, they were allowed. And, uh, so it's not absolute, yeah. And for the certified medical physicists in that special area, there is also an equivalency uh, for that. Uh, there may be a situation where you don't really have a certified medical physicist in diagnostic radiology, but then if there is a board certified radiologist and you work with that radiologist, as a matter of fact, for that long period of time, two years, three years, we would accept that, that radiologist as a qualified radiologist to give you that kind of recommendation letter saying that you work in these areas and so on. So that, these are kind of, again, variations that we need specific attention on case by case basis. Yes. Right. So case by case, so, so the procedure would, if we are not sure whether we qualify or not. The best way is to submit an application, submit your CV, submit your transcript, and let the committee evaluate and determine. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Um, is there an age limit to, to try for certification? There is no age limit, I guess. To my knowledge, there is no age limit. <laughs> We even accept women. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have a lot of women who are certified by the IMPCV. I haven't looked and counted, but I know we've been examining quite a few on the uh, oral exam. Yeah, um, in Malaysia, our medical physicists, I mean, those who work as medical physicists in the field, that 70% are women. So there's yeah. a lot of women medical physicists in Malaysia. And that's right. the same across all the, uh, I think the Asian countries, I think. Yeah, especially in Thailand. Thailand, yes. Yeah. Right. Um, now, Malaysia, we are actually embarking on, you know, we're just starting our Allied Health Profession Act and we are embarking on trying to set up on registration framework on medical for medical physicists that's currently based on qualification-based criteria, not competency-based criteria. Um, do you have any advice for, 
for us, you know, how, how, you know, what, how should we get, go forward in this? So now we are only setting up the registration for medical physicists and to determine who are, you know, who can register and who can work as medical physicists. Currently, we are just starting to use qualification base. How can we go forward? Um, Raymond or Adal or Thomas? Well I would say that I'll give you an example from the United States. In the United States, every state has its actually own all recognizing medical physicists, uh, with licensed or not licensed, uh, uh, and they, they, they establish the requirements for uh, qualifications and so on. So registration, some of them require registration. You register with the Department of Health there. Some of them requires you to have a license in the specific area. Some of them don't really care. It's, historically, they didn't even bother asking for any particular qualifications. So, but of course, nowadays with the complexity of the fields and specialties, everybody's paying attention to this. And it is the hospitals, however, employing you that would actually pay attention to whether to take you if you are board certified or not board certified. Um, so it, there is some flexibility still there in the United States, but in other areas like the NRC, for instance, or irradiation therapy, unless you are board certified, you may not be able to uh, do treatment planning or do specific aspects of the field. So I'm not too sure about other countries, I, I, I would, excuse me, yeah, I would encourage uh, continuing to work with the government. <clears throat> and I just hope that the Professional Medical Physics Association can provide input and be involved and then help them to develop, uh, to set the, the bar uh, high enough to meet the international standard. Yeah, of course, the government might decide that the bar should be set certain level that they can afford uh, to hire a physicist. And uh, although then the, it would impact on the, on the quality care, uh, health care. So uh, medical physicists, uh, medical, yeah, that they, they would have to look at all aspects together and imagine that when they get old, when they need the radiation oncology treatment, and do they want to have people who are less qualified, you know, to work? So uh, it, it is a complex uh, economic financial uh, situation to decide. Yeah, I, and legacy, legacy issue as well. I think that uh, Raymond has made a really good point uh, about the, the quality of the practitioner who will look after your relatives or people you, you value. And another important aspect uh, we found is that it is a gradual process. Uh, in the first step, uh, it is relatively uh, acceptable to governments or regulators to have guidelines, non-binding guidelines. Uh, which specify a certain uh, certification or uh, quality of practitioners. Uh, that gives, allows for grandfathering, allows for all the things uh, an employer and a government needs to think about. Uh, and then only after a certain time, uh, as Colin uh, or Raymond said, this can become enshrined in, in licensing if once there are enough people who can actually hold that up. But very quickly, we found in Australia at least, after guidelines suggested or recommended that a certified medical physicist should be involved, as soon as things come to a court, to a legal proceeding or an insurance claim, uh, people ask not what is the law, but they ask, why have you not employed a certified medical physicist? And that is often enough to really swing the, the public opinion at, at around. So I, I would think this is not an all or nothing process. Uh, at least in our in environment, it's a slow process of creating enough people, meeting some of the government's needs, which is uh, payment, which is having enough people uh, uh, available, being uh, uh, away from the front pages of the newspapers, uh, all, all, all that uh, plays, plays a role. 
Yeah, thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Dr. Wu, so for such a, uh, you know, very insightful demonstration. I mean, every one of us wants, you know, when we're old or even our relatives to be treated with quality, uh, quality uh, medical services, you know, we, we want to, to trust the services that we have in here and to have that you know, we want to definitely want to improve on our medical physics profession as this is very crucial to ensure patient safety. Now, um, is there a certification limit to those that are working in clinical settings only? Perhaps there are people who are working as lecturers or academics, but not involved or teaching, not involved in working or regulatory department, which are actually not in the hands in the clinic. Um, should they or can they be eligible to consider to apply for certification? Yeah, Colin probably would be the best to answer this question. No, I don't. I don't see why they need it uh, if they're not handling uh, patients or equipment that's right. used on patients. They're not involved directly in quality assurance in hospitals. They don't need certification. Right. The whole idea of certification. If they are involved in teaching. If they're involved in teaching the medical physics uh, uh, master's program or undergraduate program, um, if they don't have the certification, would would that not have less, would they have less convincing, you know? Uh, now we have, a, for instance, in the USA, we have a lot of medical physicists that are involved in industry, they're involved in teaching, they're involved in research. They don't have any involvement with patients or equipment they're not certified. A lot of people are not certified in the USA, a lot of medical physicists. Some of the most famous educators were never certified. I'm thinking of John Cameron, for instance. We all know John Cameron, one of the most famous medical physicists. He never got certified because he was never involved in the clinic. He was always involved in teaching and research. So there's no need. Oh, so, the, so, so in your view, the, uh, the Baseline is where if you are involved in patient care, then it is essential for you to get certification. But if you're not, yeah. that's not a necessary thing exactly. required. You yeah. can still be a good teacher, just like John Cameron, um, inventor, industry person. Um, right, that's good. On that note, how about for these people, should they go for, should they be registered under the medical physics registration or not? in your country, in America, in Australia, are, are they registered? We don't really have registration. We have registration in individual states. Adele mentioned that, um, but they're cl clinically qualified people. These aren't, these aren't the educators. These aren't the industrial physicists that get registered. The only idea of re reason for registering is that you're gonna be handling equipment that's gonna be used on patients. Mm -hmm. The we, we will have, for example, in Australia, uh, teachers and educators need to have a certain diploma that is very similar to a certification of medical physicists. They need to have a teaching diploma and that tests what is important for a teacher, that they can provide information that they value uh, diversity and have all the right attributes of a teacher. And I, I think that's probably more important for an educator, uh, at least if they work in a public uh, teaching institution. But right. the supply and demand makes a difference, uh, is that uh, some people even who teaches in schools, that if they decided that, uh, you know, that the schools are medical school or in such a, you know, the demand is such that uh, they want the professor who are board certified, and uh, then you know, then they 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 you know they would need to do it, and that's up to them. Uh, I don't think that we should require that or any regulatory agency that deals with clinical situation should require a certification if they don't work with the patient. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, um, it, we already 15 minutes past our original set time for the webinar. And Can I ask a question? 
Yeah, sure. <laughs> My question is mm -hmm. that in Malaysia, uh, I know that you know, like so many percent of people who might not have met the core physics and uh, mathematics requirements, but they would have practice in the field clinically for a long time. Now, uh, IMPCB would love to accommodate these people. And these people, I think if the university uh, can create some remedial courses, you know, for these people who might be practicing and working and they have to go at night, nighttime, and uh, they just have to meet certain requirements, you know, like that, that is, uh, you know, a, a bona fide uh, mm -hmm. program that uh, they will take exams and and then go through those courses and that would be acceptable. Thank right. you. That was a very nice, thank you for suggesting such an avenue. Uh, I think it is possible for such kind of, uh, so they don't have to sit for the whole bachelor of physics, but if they can you know, get a such talk if we, there is a bridging program or we can actually talk to universities and say, could you provide this, 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 this topic for us and then give them a certificate after they, they pass the exam that could work as an additional transcript to whatever they have the academic qualification that they have. That's right. That's correct. correct. Thank you. And I, I wouldn't be surprised that these people after they pass and they would get fully certified by IMPCB in flying colors. I mean that they might have a very good clinical experience. And uh, so I, I love to accommodate them. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so, Although I would love to continue the session much longer and I appreciate a lot of comments from the, the attendees as well. Yes, and certainly we all agree that mathematics and computing and physics, basic physics is very, very important to help a medical physics understand what we are doing. And my supervisor, my PhD supervisor used to tell me that I don't want you to be a chamber DP medical physicist you need have to be a very a real physicist. Uh, that's uh, Professor Anatoly Rosenfield who told me that. So that always remains in my mind. And I think we all should look forward to be that. Um, not just physicists who know how to carry out step-by-step -step QC, but understand what is, what's the, why, why are we doing each step? You know? Because technology are always changing and evolving. You know? The same procedure might not work, with a new technology, you know, with all the new advanced Linux machines, you know, we have to work differently, more clever, you know. Right. So I think we shall we would like to end the session today because we are already it's already 1048 a.m. at in Malaysia and it's already Bedtime. almost eleven. <laughs> almost eleven in uh, New York and LA. Um that the autumn and adults time zone. And Raymond, you are at? Almost eight o'clock. Almost happy. eight o'clock. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Raymond, we, thank, Raymond we, we, we thank them very much for spending their evenings with us and help us helping us to understand the INPCB framework and how we can, each of us, and I just to let you know, we have 104 uh, participants in this webinar today and there's a that, that indicates that so much interest in Malaysia I think that mostly 90% are Malaysians so much interest in in this matter um, certainly it shows that there is a lack and there's a gap in what we have in the medical physics training and certification in the country and we really need to do work as a group united towards getting this done in our country so we thank our thank panelists today. And thank you hopefully for this organizing this. Yes. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. And thank you everyone uh, so, for staying, hanging in there. So we, uh, we hope that with this session, we can encourage more 
uh, people from Malaysia because we're actually quite scared to try this. But it seems that um, from what I've heard, you know, it, I think all of us, if we can, you know, if we're eligible, we should give it a go. Um, and hopefully that will encourage more to approach IMPCB. And so basically, if you're not sure, if you're not sure whether you qualify or not, you know, apply to the committee and they will then evaluate your qualification, your CVs, all your work, your experience, and they will make they tell you whether you are eligible to take those exams or not. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, no no penalty, and you don't even need to pay the fee until you are allowed and accepted to take the exam. Uh, and then for accreditation of your own certification program, also that you can start to have a conversation with IMPCB, and uh, you don't need to uh, pay for the fee at the beginning. So once you decided to do that, then uh, we can help as much as possible and yeah I'd love to be able to get the Malaysian medical physicists uh, uh, get together and and form your own medical physics board uh, hopefully after some more people are taking the direct certification then you have a group of people who are really qualified and that would help yeah it's a long-term process so I wish you luck and we would like to help. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa and Dr. Krohn and Dr. Otten. Um, so thank you all the attendees for uh, joining us today. And just a quick reminder that we will be having uh, another, tomorrow we will be having the medical uh, Physics role and current issues webinar. So we'll be having physicists from all from respective experienced physicists from respective field from radiotherapy, nuclear medicine, diagnostic imaging, as well as regulatory to be speaking to us. So very interesting session for especially for students and uh, publics who are interested to know what medical physics is all about. Um, that I think in the chat, the host has already been sending out a feedback, feedback form. So the form are actually for the whole series of webinar in this week. So you can choose to submit them now, or you can choose to submit them later once you completed all the sessions. You don't have to complete all, every session to submit the form and get your e-certificates. So thank you very much and have a good evening, have a good day. And good night to uh, Colleen and Adam <laughs> and Raymond as well. Okay, bye everybody. Bye.